And this series is being hosted by myself and Crystal Colden and Jeanette Cobian, both from the University of California, Merced. So we're really pleased this week to bring in another great presenter. Uh, this week's presentation is gonna be by Neil LaRoe, who is from the University of Nevada, Reno. He's an assistant professor in the Department of Physics Atmospheric Sciences Program. And his uh, research area focuses on atmospheric science as it relates to wildland fires. So we are very excited to have him here. His research program leverages modern observing and modeling systems to advance our understanding of atmospheric dynamics of wildfire plumes, cumulus convection, and boundary layer processes, especially in mountain settings. He was previously at San Jose State University uh, and now at the University of Nevada, Reno. So with that, uh, I'm pleased to introduce you. And remember, please, during the presentation, if you have any questions, please put these questions into the Q&A forum on the bottom. If there are any technical difficulties or, or other questions uh, for myself and those managing the presentation, please feel free to put those into the chat and we'll deal with those right away. The questions will be handled at the end. Thank you so much. All right. Well, thank you. And uh, it's a real honor to be talking to this group today uh, and to be included as an honorary member of, of California, even though I'm just across the border in, uh, in Nevada. Though my house, is, my house is in California, so I, I pay my taxes. Um, yeah, like I said, real, real honor to be talking to the group today. Um, and what I'm going to be talking about are radar and LIDAR observations of wildfire plume dynamics. Obviously, this is a pretty timely uh, topic as we're still in the midst of a rather remarkable and record setting fire season where we're seeing some real extremes of, of wildfire behavior. And hopefully some of these data can shed light on, on some of those behaviors that we're seeing. Um, I also want to acknowledge that there are many people that have contributed to the work that I'm going to be showing today. Uh, they're listed here on, on the bottom. Hopefully I haven't forgotten anybody and a lot of this work is, is ongoing. Um, and so we certainly welcome feedback as, as well. Uh, I always like to start these things by talking a little about what my scientific interests are, and especially when talking about wildfire, because I think fire means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. It's such a multidisciplinary field, um, you know, everything from, from ecology to combustion uh, to the atmospheric response. And my background is in atmospheric science. I'm a meteorologist by training. And as a result, that's kind of where I focus my scientific inquiry. And in particular, I'm interested in this question of how does the atmosphere respond to fire fluxes of heat, moisture, and aerosol, right? So that we can see over here, there, there's, a, there's a fire and it's injecting heat and moisture and smoke aerosol and ash particles into the atmosphere. How does the atmosphere respond to that? In particular, uh, I'm increasingly focused on the second question, under what conditions do fire ge fires generate tornado strain vortices and deep pyrocumulonimbus clouds? So we could picture that sometimes these fires generate these, these deep bright white clouds on the top, um, sometimes extending up to the top of the troposphere, generating lightning. Um, and these fires, of course, generate their own wind fields. Uh, what is the structure of those wind fields? And under what conditions can that wind field collapse into coherent tornado strain vortices? The tools that I use to do my science are primary, primarily observational tools. I do some modeling as well, but mostly what I'm going to be talking about is using radars, LIDARs, and to a lesser extent, satellite observations of wildfire plumes. And you can see some of those tools here on the bottom. And then, of course, I've added Twitter as a science tool, which is somewhat of a joke, but also, in all seriousness, uh, it's pretty amazing the crowdsourcing ability that we have right now to understand some of the extremes of fire behavior that might have slipped through the cracks in the past and allow us to uh, formulate hypotheses and, and hone our analysis based on uh, this, this amazing crowdsourced ability to, to look at what's going on in wildfires, especially here in the Western United States. So I want to talk about the, the tools that I'm going to use to make sure that we're all on the same page uh, here. So on, on this slide, I'm showing at, at the top a NEXRAD radar animation of the Creek Fire uh, from September 5th. And on the bottom, a research radar, a KA band scanning radar, set of observations of a prescribed fire in Utah. And so it turns out that radars, uh, which are traditionally used for observing precipitating systems in the atmosphere, are also very good tools for observing wildfires. 
So radars work by emitting a pulse of electromagnetic radiation, typically at millimeter to centimeter wavelengths. And a small fraction of that energy is going to bounce back to the radar off of suspended scatterers in the atmosphere, traditionally raindrops and the like. But wildfires emit a ton of particulate ash. These are millimeter to centimeter scale particles that we call pyrometeors. And those are also very good at bouncing energy back to the radar and thus makes radar an exceptional tool to look at the dynamics of these plumes. Um, a few quick notes, um, the energy that comes back to the radar is proportional to the, to the size. And in fact, it's very sensitive to the sixth power of the size of the, the targets that it's hitting, as well as to the number concentration. And so the radar data that you're seeing on the right is kind of a measure of both the size and the total number of particles in the atmosphere, where the red colors in there would indicate very heavy loading of ash in the atmosphere, and thus can trace out the convective updrafts. The second tool that I'm going to talk about is a, is a LIDAR. Um, this operates a lot like the radar, only instead of using millimeter to centimeter wavelengths, we're now emitting 1.5 micron or near infrared laser light into the atmosphere and letting that bounce back to the sensor. And in this case, the primary sensitivity is to submicron smoke particles, um, which is the PM 2.5 that we hear so much about and worry about breathing. It does bounce off the ash as well. Um, but so this is gonna kind of give us a, an ability to, to measure what's going on in, in the plume in the same way that the radar does. And you can see an example of that here on the right. All right, so what am I gonna do with these tools? Um, well, like I said, I'm very interested in this idea of intense vortices and wildland fire. It's not a, not a new idea, um, but some of the observations that we're able to get are new. And I would argue that we have a pretty good understanding of a number of processes that can lead to intense vorticity, vertical axis vorticity, strong rotation in the atmosphere in association with uh, both flaming combustion and just in general with the heat injected into the atmosphere. And you can see some of those processes in this nice review summary from Tahiti et al, um, showing things like shedding vortices downstream of fires, the interaction of discrete fire sources and generating um, a, a coherent world, and in, even things like fire line geometry as they could affect the development of these vortices. And so some of what I'm gonna talk about today is to what extent do we see these processes play out in real world fires outside of the laboratory and with scanning radars and lidars. So I'm gonna talk about four cases today, each highlighting a somewhat different process giving rise to uh, intense atmospheric vortices. Uh, this first case is from the Stony Fire in 2014. This was at Fort Hunter Liggett in California. This was the very first fire that I ever went to. And I had the good fortune, I suppose, to have this develop right in front of my eyes. This is not a real-time image, but a, a time lapse stitched together from uh, my, my unsteady hand as I was taking photographs of this thing developing right in front of me. What we can see is whole column rotation and anticyclonic sense here linked to intense combustion at the surface. And I had the scanning LIDAR in the, the back of a, of a truck. I was working with Craig Clements at San Jose State University at the time. We were able to make scans back and forth through the base of this thing. And what's exciting about that is it allows us to document and quantify the structure of this vortex and how it evolves. Some basics, uh, this particular one lasted for about 30 minutes, traversed along the ridge line spanning about one kilometer and remain linked to intense combustion throughout its evolution. The LIDAR data shown over here on the right reveals the classic vortex signature that we expect where the red shows flow away from the LIDAR and the blue flow toward the LIDAR and thus a strong sense of rotation about a vortex right here. The bottom shows the attenuated backscatter from this, which is basically the smoke concentration. And you can see these alternating bands of clear and smoky air wrapping into the center of this vortex. So we'll see a lot of images in this, in this talk that leverage this basic idea that there's this couplet between in and outbound velocity that describes the location of the vortex. So the first question we can ask is what is the basic structure of this vortex and does it look like those and other geophysical flows? Um, there are a number of empirical representations of vortices and one of which is uh, something called the Berger's vortex. And if I take a cross section of the velocity right through the middle of this thing, I, I find a profile that agrees quite nicely with the, the structure of, of, of Berger's vortex where we have uh, zero flow right, right in the center and then strong in and outbound flows on, on either side 
here we have the magnitude at about 13 and 15 meters per second, which allows us to estimate the vorticity in here uh, across the, the extrema, which in this case is about 0.4 inverse seconds roughly, which is similar to the strength of an F0 tornado or maybe a gust nado, and similar to that in many dust devils. So strong, but nothing uh, you know, particularly exceptional in this case. Another interesting aspect of this case is that we can ask the question, what processes contribute to vortex intensification? And what we'll look at here is a sequence of these LIDAR scans through the base of the vortex. And I would call your attention to the fact that there's a confluent shear line with two initial distinct vortices on here. By eye, we could really only see this one, but in the LIDAR data, there is a second uh, shear maximum right back here. And over the next few minutes, we'll watch the second shear maxima come uh, in, in proximity to the first one, begin to orbit around it, and then suddenly merge with it. And so let me just go back and forth between these last two slides here. You can see the distinct vortices still here, and then suddenly a larger and stronger vortex as the two vortices merge. That vortex then persists and becomes the dominant vortex that lasted for a long period of time. What I like about that is it's a clear example of the convergence of vorticity into, into a local uh, maxima. And that's something that we know exists in other vortices like dust devils. The image on the bottom right here uh, is, is taken from some simulations of a dust devil merger that shows a very similar evolution. Two distinct vortices that begin to orbit one another and eventually merge to form a single stronger vortex in time. We can also look at kind of the vertical structure in here, and this is mostly done by eye because I was only scanning at one elevation. There's a schematic from Church et al. 1980 that looks at the, the structure of helical updrafts and man-made vortices from intense combustion. And if we look at a photograph from the time of this vortex merger, we can see a similar structure uh, of, of this particular vortex where we have two intertwined vortices, both anticyclonic in this case, uh, wrapped around one another in the vertical before they merged to form the single larger vortex. So like I said, this was the very first fire that I went to and it really whet my appetite, I think, to, to understand what's going on in these. And uh, for the rest of the talk, I'll, I'll move on to some more, more recent work. But as, as a summary of this, we had a long-lived anticyclonic vortex, traversed the, the ridge for one kilometer, at a maximum anticyclonic vorticity consistent with that in, in dust devils and very, very low grade tornadoes. Demonstrated both helical updrafts and the merger of smaller vortices to create this single larger vortex with time. All right, so that's case one, kind of process one. I'm now gonna move on to a, a very recent case and we'll call this case two, multi-remote sensor observations of plume-plume interaction during a rotating pyrocumulus column. And uh, this is work that I'm doing uh, with, with Craig Clements, Taylor Adele, Matt Brewer, and Adam Kachansky. All right, so to set up this case, uh, I have two perspectives on this slide. Uh, this is a fire out in the Fish Lake National Forest in Utah, a prescribed fire in this case. And on the right, we're looking at the GOES-17 visible imagery of this fire. And what you'll see is a deep convective column develop capped with a deep pyrocumulus cloud, borderline pyrocumulonimbus. On the left, I'll show a time lapse of the plume evolution from the surface. And wow, it's very, very laggy on my computer right now. It appears like it doesn't like the, uh, the zoom interface. But we can see intense combustion. And unfortunately, it's, it's too choppy at the moment to show you that there was a period of very strong rotation in there. So the, the goals of this portion of the talk are to describe the vigorous convection and plume evolution, the pyrocumulus initiation, and also the aspect of, of strong rotation in this particular plume. So here's the experimental setup for, for this case. Um, this is probably the best observed pyrocumulus plume to, to date. We had the San Jose State scanning KA band radar, as well as two Doppler LIDARs. And they were creating interleaved um, scans back and forth and up and down through this plume as it developed for its entire evolution. Um, it was ignited by uh, an aerial drip torch and, and heavy fuels. It had about a thousand acre burn. And this was part of the FASME, the fire and smoke model evaluation experiment. <clears throat> so 
So what, what, what we'll do is we'll use these radar and LIDAR data um, taken from these scan patterns to try to understand the, the plume evolution. Okay, so to begin with on the left, we'll look at the radar animation of the convection from the plume. So what we're looking at is the radar reflectivity here, showing the lofting of pyrometeors and kind of all these exquisite details of the convective pulses going up into and then initiating a deep pyrocumulus cloud. On the right, we can collapse that into a time height perspective that shows the evolution of the plume top, which is the, the black line here. So we start out at about 5,500 meters. Uh, the ground surface here is quite high, about 3,000 meters. We're in a high elevation forest. And then we'll watch as the plume goes through a, a sequence of rapid deepening steps uh, as it first init initiates a pyrocumulus and then a deep pyrocumulus cloud up to about 10 kilometers. Everything above the, the green dash line here is, is in the cloud. And we can see the individual convective pulses originating from the bottom left and moving up to the top right uh, during the evolution here. From this, we can also look at the velocity components from, from the radar data and trace out the updrafts and the downdrafts. So on the left, the same sort of time height perspective, but I'm looking at the 95th percentile of the radar derived Doppler velocities. And again, we see these bottom left to top right moving streaks and each of these are the convective updrafts moving up through the cloud. You'll note that there are strong updrafts both beneath cloud base and uh, especially in the cloud during these periods right in here, where you have updrafts in excess of 25 meters per second. Within the cloud layer, we actually get downdrafts to develop as well. If we look at the fifth percentile of the velocity data, that's going to show me some of the downdraft circulations. And you'll see that most of the downdrafts are confined above the condensation level. And they originate at the top left and move back to the bottom right, giving you a sense of that sinking motion with, with time. Now, these downdrafts are not extending to the surface. They're not the sort of downdrafts that we'd be worried about as far as impacting surface fire behavior. So that's sort of just a macroscopic overview of, of the plume evolution in this case. But what I'm really interested in is the period of, of strong rotation. So we're gonna try this video again. I'm not sure if it's gonna, yeah, it's very jumpy on Zoom. Um, there's a period in here where the plume goes upright and develops strong anticyclonic circulation. So what I'm gonna do here is take the LIDAR data and look at a volume representation of this plume which is shown here on the right. <clears throat> so this is basically the updraft column. You can see the smoke wrapping around the backside. And if we add to this, the inbound velocity is blue. We'll see that the right side of the plume is characterized by flow toward the LIDAR in this case. And on the left side of the plume, lookers left here, we'll put the outbound velocities as red. And you get a sense of then the very strong anticyclonic rotation wrapped right around the plume axis in here. We can pull out individual slices with the, with the LIDAR data here and look at the, the development of this velocity couplet. And what I'm showing here is the lowest elevation scan, which is right through here near the base, and one right up here at five degrees above horizontal and one at 10 degrees, or, or uh, actually five, 10, and 15 rather. So in each of these, we see a velocity couplet, but the couplet gets smaller in radius as we go up and mostly more intense as we go up with height. And what we're looking at here is the contraction of the plume that you can see this kind of inflow region at the base contracting into a small waste region and then broadening again with height. We can make the same sort of computations that we did for our first case, looking at the magnitude of the vorticity and the strength of the rotational winds in here. Again, we have an anticyclonic rotation in this case, the vorticity is about half as strong as it was in our first case, although the magnitude of the wind is about the same. What's different here is the radius of the plume. We have a broader plume rotating with similar wind speeds and thus the, the magnitude of the vorticity is a little bit lower. But really the interesting question for me is why do we have rotation here? And I'm not sure that we can entirely answer that question, but we can examine uh, some possibilities. So for example, we saw in one of the earlier slides that both L-shaped fire lines and plume-plume interactions can, can lead to rotation in wildfire plumes. So uh, while this is still a, a case study in development, when we look at the, the radar data, if we look at a cross-section of the radar data, we can see 
the plume plume interaction developing in this case. There is an, uh, a further downstream plume here and an upstream plume here that are in drafting towards one another into this waste region that I described in, in the previous slide. We can kind of summarize that with the, the time mean perspective. On the left, the uh, reflectivity from the radar and on the right, the radial velocity components. And you can clearly see these two different plume elements in drafting toward one another and then merging with height. We can also track the magnitude of convergence by taking the radial velocity components here and differencing them with the radial velocity components here. That's gonna represent the flow into the base of the plume, whereas the LIDAR data in this case is showing me the rotational component of the wind. And what we see is that the period of rotation has a pronounced spike in this convergent inflow and plume-plume interaction going on during this period, this indrafting region here, where the red is basically showing the flow away from you, the blue the flow toward you. And so when those two are both uh, at, at their maximum, we have very, very strong convergence into the plume base. Looking back at the LIDAR data again, the top here is showing a sequence of PPI scans, so the cross-section through the base of the plume uh, at the five and 10 degree elevation tilt and time increases from left to right. The black contours are showing the distribution of the fire line in terms of where the smoke is rising at that level. And so during this period here of plume-plume interaction, uh, what we see is that the period of in intense rotation, which you can see is the, the red and blue shading in, in these different uh, panels, is also a period where we have strong interaction between two discrete fire sources, which then begin to merge into this uh, kind of L-shaped fire configuration in here. Why do we have this? Well, in this case, we have it because they're igniting things with a, a helicopter and they're progressively moving along. And in this case, the, the second ignition leads to this element that uh, eventually takes off with the strong rotation. But it appears to be that its interaction with the initial ignition is, is a very significant factor in, in the, the case development. I think we probably have some more work to do to, to really understand what, what's going on in here, why exactly that leads to rotation in this case. And I, I would highlight that this case actually has extremely weak ambient winds. The winds are only a few meters per second near the surface. So this is almost entirely dominated by the, uh, by the plume itself rather than its interaction with the, with the ambient flow. Uh, and that's a concept that I'll return to in, in one of the later cases here. Okay, so now that we've addressed a little bit about the rotation, um, let's ask the question, basically, where is the pyrocumulus cloud base in here? How can we determine that? And what's going on inside of that cloud in this case? So on the right, I'm showing two different volume renderings of the plume. The top is the LIDAR backscatter and the bottom is the radar reflectivity. What we can see is that they agree pretty well in the lower atmosphere, albeit they're sensing slightly different things. But in the upper atmosphere, fear here, they're, they're radically different. And what's going on here is that the LIDAR attenuates as soon as it hits liquid water, whereas the longer wavelengths of the radar can see right into and through the cloud. And so really the difference in the radar volume versus the LIDAR volume here can be used to trace out the structure of the pyrocumulus cloud. We can see that on the left here as well by looking at the, the backscatter and radial velocity from the LIDAR and noting the sharp cutoff right around 5,500 meters and what that is, is the cloud base. It's the flat cumulus cloud base where we're getting condensation in the plume. So we can use that information. Um, we can first take out a cross section of the, of the radar data here and overlay onto that the LIDAR data and trace out the, the structure of the plume. So it, again, the, the difference between these two fields, the sharp cutoff here is the region that the cloud is occupying. And we know then that the cloud explodes vertically uh, shortly after this time. And we can make some interesting inferences about the, the thermodynamics of the cloud there, because now that we know the cloud base, and we also know the cloud top from the radar, we can place it in the context of, of a radioson observation to understand the thermodynamic structure of that cloud itself. And I'm not gonna get into a, a whole lot of detail here, but as we've seen in many of these cases, these pyrocumulus clouds live on what we would call skinny cape 
there's just a little bit of moist instability in the atmosphere that they're able to tap into and thus drive the plume quite a bit deeper into the atmosphere. In this case, we can see that, that the radar echo top is exactly where this plume becomes negatively buoyant or neutrally buoyant aloft in, in the cloud base is somewhere down here. So if that's true, the cloud tapping into moist instability should generate very strong updrafts within the cloud. We're adding buoyancy into the air uh, and we should be accelerating air parcels. And that's exactly what we see. If we look at the radar data here, we can track above 5,500 meters uh, the occurrence of some very strong updrafts, which we'll see as these uh, blue regions propagating up and to the right here. And those blues in there are actually folded velocities where it's exceeding the Nyquist frequency of the, of the radar. And so uh, they're up around 35 to 40 meter per second updrafts in this cloud. You can also see the downdraft region in here over to the right. And again, this is going to be associated with evaporative cooling in the cloud, as well as mechanically induced turbulence and negatively buoyant parcels returning back to their equilibrium level. I think the photo on the right shows, shows all of these regions very nicely, the active cloud growth characterized by these very strong updrafts, as well as the evaporative region where we're leaving behind smoke but evaporating the cloud over here, uh, which seems to correspond nicely with this, this evaporatively cooled downdraft in this region. I'll skip over that one for now. Okay, so that was case two. We looked at strong rotation in a prescribed fire, as well as the development of a, of a pyrocumulus cloud. Now we're going to move on to case three, uh, which is really kind of moving way upscale in terms of the intensity of circulation that can develop in wildfires. And so this is a case drawn from the car fire. Um, and what we're going to be looking at here is, can we consider this a, a true case of what we would call pyro tornado genesis? And in this case is an ambient shear zone responsible for the rotation that ultimately leads to the, to the um, intense convection here, or uh, the intense rotation. So again, these videos don't seem to agree very well with the broadcasting of Zoom, but we can see here that we're in a totally different regime than uh, for these weaker rotations that I've shown previously. We have huge flames uh, being lofted up into this rotating convective column uh, we also have periods where there's flaming debris that is lofted deep into the atmosphere and extreme inflow winds uh, evident as the sheeting and extreme flame lamps along the surface. What's the impact of that? Well, we know that in this particular case, uh, based on the damage, some of which is pictured here, uh, that the near surface wind speeds were estimated to be around 140 miles per hour. Recall these earlier cases, we're looking at winds of like 30 miles per hour in the rotation that I'm showing. So we're, uh, you know, two to three times as, as strong here uh, in, in, in this case. Unfortunately, this was linked to uh, both a firefighter fatality as, as well as um, a number of civilian casualties and fatalities uh, in Northwest Reading. This was back in the, the summer of 2018, back in what seemed like a then bad fire season. We, we know better now, I guess. Um, <clears throat> and, what I want to look at here is what role does a, a shear zone and pyrocumulonimbus initiation play in, in the development of this? So the first thing we're going to do is use NEXRAD radar data to look at the structure of the plume, which is shown here, along with the location of the vortex, which is shown as the black line. And what we can see is that the vortex uh, extends from the, the corner of the fire here up through the core of the convective column, which then extends to almost 12. Uh, 10 kilometers in this case. On the right, I've extracted some of the, the radar um, radial velocity data at different heights in the atmosphere from about 8,000 feet up to 15,000 feet, showing the, the couplet and velocity data that, that this event presented with, where the velocity, uh, the rotation here uh, is, is cyclonic. Uh, we have outbound flow here, inbound flow here, and we have a, a coherent rotation up to about 15,000 feet above the surface. So extreme plume depth in this case. So how do we go um, from kind of no vortex to vortex in this case? If we look at the, the radar radial velocity data from the lowest elevation scan, we're going to look at a sequence in time moving from left to right, overlaid on the fire perimeter, which is the red line here. 
what we start off with is a region of increasing wind shear above the fire line. For the 30 minutes before the vortex forms, there is evidence of strong opposing winds in the atmosphere. Okay, and you can see that here, the blue colors are toward the radar, which is down here to the southeast at Beale Air Force Base. And the, and the warm shades are, are flow going in the opposite direction. And it's draped right above the fire line. And over this 30 minute period, you can see that the, the colors increase in time here, indicative of increasing shear in this region. But there is no vortex signature during that time, simply an increasing shear signature. I picture this shear as something like flow on a, on a highway where we have um, two opposing flows of traffic separated by a median. And if we were to put a, a pinwheel in here, of course it would spin, right? We'd be pushing on it in, in one direction here and the other direction down here. And so it gives us a source, a potential source for rotation. That's exactly what we see then uh, in the following 30 minutes, in the period of vortex formation. We go from simply having a shear zone to collapsing that shear zone into a concentrated vortex directly over the fire perimeter. So linked to the fire itself here. And you can see that the, the strength of the gate to gate shear increases with time in this case. So we've gone from simply a shear zone to collapsing that into a vortex circulation during this period. What causes that? Well, if we look at it in time, this, this happens at the exact same time that the plume undergoes rapid deepening. So this is showing, again, the, the radar volumes, where the red and orange colors are showing regions where we have strong convective updrafts going deep into the atmosphere before they're sheared off by the ambient southwesterly flow aloft. And so the, the timing of this rapid vertical expansion it exactly corresponds to the timing of vortex intensification. And we know that when we expand a column of air, that mass continuity requires that we contract it laterally. And so stretching and convergence are linked in the atmosphere. And that any rotation that exists in that column has to be conserved or its angular momentum has to be conserved. So stretching this column out is gonna enhance the rate of rotation. In other words, this is quite analogous to the figure skater analogy where we start out with some weak rotation, uh, in this case, the shear zone, and we contract it either through stretching or horizontal convergence. And that should lead to the exponential increase in the, in the rotation rate. So over here on the right, what I'm looking at is the time series of the gate to gate difference in velocity in the center of the, of the vortex. And so we go from simply this ambient shear zone characterized by about 10 meters per second of gate to gate differences up to about 36 or 37 um, meters per second of gate to gate difference in what is an approximately exponential uh, increase followed by a rapid spin down when the plume collapses in this case. Not really collapses, but dissipates would be a, a better description. What's the result of that at the surface? Uh, this is probably another video that won't work very well. Um, if, if you can see this video in real time, or if perhaps you've seen it before, it, it does a remarkable job of capturing the full intensity of this event where we had winds up to about 140 miles per hour. And evident in here is also these extreme inflow winds at the surface uh, that, that are causing the, the vortex rotation here to have you know, impacts on a, over a much greater region due to those strong inflow winds, which are spreading the, the flames um, essentially horizontally across the landscape. Okay, so then the next question is, well, why does the plume undergo such rapid deepening during the period of vortex intensification? And this is where looking at satellite observations paints a very clear picture of the pyrocumulonimbus initiation in this case. So we saw this in our uh, case in, in Utah uh, and, and here we're looking at a, a, an even deeper and more impressive cloud, very rapidly uh, forming and extending upward almost to the tropopause in this case. So we're going from a fire without a cloud to the, the fire reaching its condensation level and releasing the moist instability loft, which then drives that rapid vertical plume growth. So why is that important to the underlying fire? Well, again, it's stretching out the underlying structure of the atmosphere to give us um, a spin up of vortex tubes. And a useful question to ask then is how strong are the updrafts and how wide are the updrafts in clouds like this? And I'm gonna switch gears just for a moment here and talk about a different case because it gives us some insight into what's going on inside of these clouds. 
This is um, some radar data drawn from the Pioneer Fire, which was a fire in Idaho in 2016. And this is from a paper uh, led by Bruno Rodriguez, um, which was just published in, in GRL earlier this week. So I'd encourage you to check that out if you're, if you're interested. And in this case, what we're doing is flying an aircraft with a downward pointed radar, looking down into the development of a deep pyrocumulonimbus cloud. And these are three different radar overpasses showing the vertical velocity along with the plume structure. And let's just look at the left panel here for a moment. And I want to call your attention to the color scale here at the top, which goes from negative 15 meters per second all the way up to 60 meters per second. And if we look here in this portion of the plume, what we find is an updraft width of about two kilometers uh, with a broad region of updrafts exceeding 50 meters per second and the strongest updrafts up to 58.1 meter, uh, meters per second uh, up here in the upper portion of the plume. That's a 130 mile an hour updraft far above the surface, right? We're up here at almost five kilometers, uh, almost three kilometers above the surface here. And it turns out these updrafts, 130 mile an hour updraft, uh, rivals those that we experience in supercell thunderstorms, the strongest storm systems that, that we know on Earth. And so really, if we think about the internal dynamics of, of these plumes, there's some really impressive stuff going on here and uh, really highlights the, how we can go from a, a relatively weak shear zone to, to having in, intense circulation if you're driving this sort of updraft into the atmosphere. How does the fire respond? Uh, so moving back to the car fire case here. Well, the fire itself rapidly intensifies in response to the formation of the vortex linked to the overlying pyrocumulus cloud. And in, in this case, what we actually see is there's a little bit of a time lag even between the explosive plume growth, which happens first, and then uh, the fire pixels intensifying in, in their magnitude. Uh, this is looking down from, from GOES-17 at the, the surface temperature essentially, and the, the two micron channel uh, is that brightest pixel. And so we, we see a little bit of a lead lag relationship here where it appears that the pyrocumulus goes first, and then we get vortex intensification uh, linked to fire intensification in this case. So kind of a feedback between the cloud and the surface process. Although I admit, we don't know exactly what's going on at the surface here. So there's some uncertainty in that, that process chain. Okay, so putting this case all together before we move on to our last case, we have a fire embedded in a shear zone that initiates a pyrocumulus cloud, which helps to collapse that shear zone into an intense circulation. And if you're a fan of the, the movie Twister, that's when we get cows. And this really fits conceptually within the, the model of non-supercell tornadoes in this case, where we, we have atmospheric convection embedded in a shear zone that collapses that shear zone into that intense vortex. And so it's somewhat different than relying on uh, kind of a supercell storm structure to develop the rotation and instead of really feeding off of that surface shear zone that we know is there based on the radar data. But I think that that sets up nicely the, the next topic here and the last one that I'll, that I'll talk about today, which is what happens when these deep pyrocumulus plumes are embedded in both strong crosswinds and crosswinds characterized by wind shear? And so I'm going to talk about three cases from this summer. These are all preliminary analyses, of course. Uh, you know, I've had all of two weeks to, to work on this. Um, and we're going to look at, on the top left, the Bear Fire, uh, which was part of the North Complex that ran down toward Lake Oroville. Uh, on the top right, the Creek Fire, uh, burning in the San Joaquin uh, River Valley. And on the bottom, the Loyalton Fire, uh, which burned here near Reno, uh, right up on the California-Nevada border um, near the town of Loyalton. And what we can see from these radar analyses and photographs is that all three of these plumes are characterized by, by deep injection into the atmosphere. Uh, the poster child here being the, the Creek Fire that uh, produced injections up almost to 16, perhaps above 16 kilometers. Uh, they're all capped by um, large pyrocumulonimbus clouds. And um, in all of these, there's a significant crosswind component that's contributing to what I'll show you is the development of a sequence of anticyclonic vortices. All right, so let's start with the Loyalton fire case. 
So here's the radar animation for the Loyalton fire showing a period of rapid plume deepening and lofting of lots and lots of pyrometeors deep into the atmosphere. And we can see in here this kind of arced structure to the plume, which is characteristic of a plume and a crosswind. If we look at this from beneath, and again, I didn't, when, I, when we practiced these, these videos worked just fine. I, I think it's the trying to stream it that uh, lags these so much. So it's going to be a little hard to see. But we'll see, this is looking from uh, the northeast toward the southwest along the mean wind. And I'm going to pause it here for just a moment. And well, no, I'm not. let's pause it right about here. What we can see developing beneath this plume are a pair of counter rotating vortices in this case. So the right arrow is showing an anticyclonic sense of rotation. Uh, associated with the strongest convection and the strongest combustion here. On the left side, we see a cyclonic rotation. And between them, kind of an inflow wind extending back against the mean wind. Again, the mean wind here is from the southwest, kind of straight into your face as you're looking into this, um, into this video. Let me turn the video back on. As the fire progresses, we're going to watch this anticyclonic portion over here uh, collapse in scale and increase in intensity. Well, the cyclonic portion remains there, but never gets as strong. So right in here, uh, it's probably hard for you to see, but there's very, very strong anticyclonic circulation extending up through this column. And we know from the surface that this is linked to uh, significant tree damage, snapping off of, of large trees, felling large, large timber in this region. Okay, and so this was an intense tornado strength vortex that formed over here. And later, another vortex formed off the same flank of the fire, which is photographed here, uh, and propagated away from the fire uh, in this narrower column, which you can see right here, something that looks more like a, a traditional tornado. So these, these two different vortices are actually quite different and got me thinking right away about what, what model best fits this particular fire. There's a, a well-known model for jets and buoyant plumes in a crosswind, wherein the plume will develop a pair of counter-rotating vortices, one cyclonic, one anticyclonic, kind of like an obstacle exposed to the wind or a rock in the river that will create vortices behind it. And those vortices go up and they become longitudinal vortices with height. So that gives us a primary counter-rotating vortex pair. And then beneath this plume, we can generate wake vortices or shedding vortices uh, that are more rope-like in their characteristic that you can see here. We also know that this, this occurs in wildland fires. Um, here's, a, here's a simulation from Cunningham et al. showing both the cyclonic and anticyclonic vorticity, um, both from a, a side view and, and a top view here. And what I'm showing you over here on the right is the radar radial velocity, as well as the radar reflectivity contours. And what we can see is this is the primary fire right here. You'll watch it develop two flanks, uh, anti-cyclonic flank here and a cyclonic flank down here that actually bifurcate with time and with height. And along the anti-cyclonic side of this, we get a sequence of very strong anti-cyclonic rotations, both embedded in the leading edge of the plume right in there, and then eventually trailing from it right through here, which is the uh, trailing vortex, which was seen in the previous photo. If we plot this as kind of like a time mean perspective, about one hour of radar data, we can see these, these features stand out quite clearly. So here's the radar reflectivity. This is the primary updraft region. There's a left flank here and a right flank here, both producing different updrafts. There's an ashfall region through here. So you can kind of picture this like the cylinder that's going up and bifurcating and then the ash is falling back out over here. On the right, if we look at the radial velocity averaged over time, we can see that there's enhanced inbound flow along both flanks of the fire, as well as a region of reversed flow that we saw in that first video uh, right here. And if we plot the location of all the vortices, they're right along the anticyclonic shear zone uh, set up between this flow splitting uh, and the reversed flow in here. Some of them are embedded in the leading uh, plume and some of them trail off here. 
we can put those vortex structures um, in a three-dimensional view. Uh, so these are the first set of vortices that form in the primary updraft on that anticyclonic flank. The black lines are showing the vortex cores and how they evolve with height and time. So they're starting in the leading vortex and progressing downstream very slowly and expanding um, vertically as they go. They're all in the updraft section, not in the downdraft section. We can also look at then the last vortex, which lasted for over an hour, which shed from the leading um, plume and then actually comes out beneath the plume and detaches from the updraft region. And is essentially pendant from the underside of the plume, characteristic of that shedding vortex evolution in this case. So we're quite excited about these data because I think it's one of the first times that we've been able to really clearly show um, these kind of different modes of vortex formation, uh, both occurring in a plume and a crosswind here. But there's a little bit of a mystery, right? Why anticyclonic? Why are we preferring one flank of a fire to the other? And this is a, a working hypothesis that we borrow from the development of large scale convective systems over the, over the plains, for example, with supercell thunderstorms that also show counter rotating vortices and tend to favor actually the cyclonic or right moving storm. And the reason they favor the cyclonic or right moving storm has to do with something called linear dynamic pressure forcing, uh, which relates to uh, the way the shear profile in the atmosphere interacts with the plume and where it creates regions of high and low pressure. And for large supercell storms, this tends to occur on the right flank of the storm and generates a high to low pressure circulation that enhances the updraft on the, on the right moving flank and suppresses the updraft on the, on the anticyclonic flank here. And this would be characterized by a veering wind profile, for example, a southeasterly surface wind becoming a south wind with height. In the Loyalton fire, as shown on the sounding over here, we have just the opposite. We have a backing wind profile where we have southwesterly surface winds becoming southerly with height, going through a counterclockwise or backing rotation with height. If this basic conceptual model makes sense, that should favor the anticyclonic side of the storm. There could be other factors. There could be fuels and topography contributing here. But what's quite interesting about this summer is that we have two other cases that we can look at this for. We can look at and test this hypothesis for the Creek Fire, which is shown here. The Creek Fire also produced long-lived tornado strength anticyclonic vortices, uh, which I'm showing with this triangular marker right here, and then in a time mean sense here on the bottom. The flow characteristics here are very similar to what we see in the Loyalton fire. We see flow splitting around the head fire, a region of reversed flow in the wake of the head fire, and in this case, enhanced shear favoring the anticyclonic flank of the fire and the long-lived vortex that formed here. We can also see the impact of the shear on the structure of the ashfall region here, which in this case is creating a shape very reminiscent of the hook echo that we would see uh, with conventional thunderstorms. Although again, in this case, it's anticyclonic as opposed to the cyclonic case. We can test this in one more scenario from this summer. And this is from the Bear Fire, which developed in very strong northeasterly downslope winds capped with a northerly wind aloft as it extends down into the Central Valley. You can see this in the animation uh, here as the fire explodes down slope, but the top of the plume is sheared off uh, by that northerly wind. And we see basically the same wind signature here. It's a little bit different because the winds are much stronger in this case. But if I look at the mean flow field for a, a one hour period, I have flow splitting around the head fire. Again, the development of reverse flow in the wake of the head fire a backing profile for the ash fallout region, and a sequence of anticyclonic vortices that form in that anticyclonic shear zone. And so that's leading us towards a conceptual model, and this is where I'm going to leave off today. We can look at all of these fires together and start noting some of the profound similarities in the radar signatures of them. I've added one more case in here. Uh, so these are the cases we just talked about, the Loyalton Bear and Creek fires. And now I've added a case from 2014, the King fire, 
And what's interesting about this is that the radar signature is very similar. We have flow splitting, reverse flow in the wake of the head fire in a trailing asphalt region. But there's no curvature in that asphalt region. And this is indicative of the unidirectional wind shear in this case. In this case also did not produce either cyclonic or anti-cyclonic vortices. It has flow splitting, has some sense of rotation, but no compact vortices. So this could suggest that we really need that ambient shear profile to develop a long-lived tornado strain vortex in, in these cases. And what would be really nice here is if we can find a case with the cyclonic uh, side of the fire favored to demonstrate that indeed, if we have a veering wind profile, we might favor that cyclonic case. And so that's something that we'll be working on from here on out. So to wrap up here, um, what I've shown you today is that LIDAR and radar data allow us to understand plume dynamics, uh, arguably in ways that we haven't been able to look at them before. I've shown you that there are multiple pathways to rotation and intensification of vortices and fire. We looked at a case of vortex merger. We looked at a case where fire line geometry and plume-plume interactions appear to be important. We then looked at the car fire case where an ambient shear zone appears to be the source of what becomes a tornadic rotation. And finally, we've looked at three cases with uh, plumes and sheared cross flows that seem to develop the anticyclonic favored rotation. And what's common to all of the cases with tornado strength rotation as opposed to weaker uh, rotation is that they are all linked to Pyro CB. And so I think there's still a lot of work to be done there, understanding the lead lag relationships between the vortices and the plume development and just how important that latent heat release in driving these clouds upward is. So with that, uh, I'll wrap up and would we'll be very happy to take your questions. Thank you, Neil. So we have a couple minutes for questions. Uh, for the audience, please go ahead and submit these to the question and answer. I want to uh, read the first one um, by Faraz uh, Angar. How do you define the plume height or boundaries, Neil? And I think that means in the context of with the data that you observe. Yeah, it's, it's going to depend a little bit on what tool we're, we're looking at. Um, for, for the next rad data, uh, it tends to be kind of between zero and, and negative 10 dBZ. Uh, for the KA band radar, it's, it's going to be somewhere, it's going to be different. Um, so it's, a, I guess, a, a little bit of a nuanced, um, a, a nuanced analysis in there, but typically it's going to be associated with very strong gradient in, in reflectivity where you're basically going uh, from a reflectivity representative of the ash loading to something representative of the clear air. Uh, and so it depends a little bit by, by the case. Um, and per, perhaps down the line, that could be something that would be homogenized, but I, I don't think we have a single definition right now to identify plume top height. And then I guess uh, there's there's one other question slash comment, and I think it was uh, mentioned uh, in some chat that you didn't see, Neil. But there's a question from a couple students actually internationally, uh, whether uh, you and then later presenters could uh, provide a few references that would be useful for reading. Um, if you can, after the fact, we'd be happy. We'll post that to our website. Yeah, I'd be, I'd be happy to. Yeah, there's a, a rich and growing literature on, on uh, vortices and wildland fire for sure. So the next question is from William Abrams. Uh, this is a long one. Are there particular radar LIDAR data points related to updrafts, rotation, wind profile, et cetera, that might be considered for incorporation in the creation of standardized smoke-related public health alerts beyond the general air quality uh, index indices? And what are the key data points that residents might benefit from in terms of a wildfire alert to supplement but not supplant the evacuation warning, mandatory evacuation Etc. Yeah, so I'll take this in uh, the, the two different parts. You know, I think the, the first thing is that we have to remember that the radar is really seeing the ash, not necessarily the, the PM 2.5. And well, we would typically expect those two things at the source to remain well correlated with one another. Over time, they stop being well correlated with one another because the ash actually falls out of the atmosphere, whereas the PM 2.5 remains suspended as an aerosol. Um, but uh, it would be conceivable, right, to make an empirical relationship between quantities like the, the reflectivity factor and what the source emission term could be for, um, for PM 2.5. But that would require, presumably, a lot of observational um, co-located data 
um, and including collecting data in the in the plume itself, uh, which is always always a challenge to get the, those sorts of data. Uh, as for kind of real time warnings, I think there's there's two things. Um, you know, the National Weather Service did issue a warning for the Loyalton fire uh, vortices. They issued a fire generated tornado warning. And that warning was disseminated to personnel on the ground. Um, and, you know, I think the recognition of both the, the vorticity or the, uh, the velocity couplet in the same way that we use that as a signature for, for tornado warnings is really important. But I would say even more than that, the early warning signal seems to be this reversed flow in, in the wake of the, of the head fire. If you start seeing that notch on the back with wind flow going in the opposite direction, um, even if we don't yet have a, a couplet in there, that it seems to be very good evidence that the fire could be moving in that direction. Um, but I think generally we need a lot of work on the, you know, where is the fire right now? How intense is the fire and where is it gonna be in the next, uh, 30 minutes, one hour in the, in the same way that we treat uh, thunderstorms. And that's a, a pretty complicated problem. Thank you, Neil. Sorry, always looking for that unmute. Yeah. Uh, the next question is from Kit Gordon. Um, how does surface topography play a role in plume dynamics? Yeah, um, they, they probably play a large role uh, topography and I haven't really really talked about that in here I, I think in the case of the creek fire we probably have a nice example there where uh, a lot of the the shear that's being experienced by by the fire the the backing wind profile is, is probably closely linked to flow channeling and thermally driven flows in the San Joaquin River Valley as opposed to the ambient flow further aloft which has a more southerly almost southeasterly component uh, in addition, at, at smaller scales, I think flow topography interactions create all sorts of potential sources of near surface rotation that can get ingested into the fire. You know, if you were to put a hill upstream of a large fire in a simulation and just blow wind over that hill and let that get ingested into the fire, there's a very good chance that the stretching mechanisms in the fire could take that vorticity and turn it into a, a, into a very strong rotation. Uh, and you know, one of the problems with topography is it's very case specific. Um, and, and so, yeah, I think, I think it will be important to understand, is there a conceptual model in here, especially for these plumes in a crosswind that, that applies broadly or, or is it very nuanced in terms of the, the number you know, specific cases in topography? Thank you. So we, we're gonna maybe one or two more questions. One uh, from Charlie Scothorn. Is it possible given photographs of old fires, uh, historic fires, can you try to back calculate wind speeds? And I'm assuming at the at the surface. Yeah, I mean, I think you'd have to have really uh, high temporal frequency um, uh, photographs to do that sort of, uh, you know, kind of like structure from motion sort of uh, photogrammetry work to understand the, the magnitude of rotation. and. Um, you know, that's, that's where it's really nice having the radar to, to quantify these, these things for us. Uh, obviously, historically, there have been cases of very, very large, um, deadly vortices in wildland fire. And, it, you know, it would be very interesting to try to understand how strong they were, but it might be a, a heavy lift. Hey, thank you. So uh, unfortunately, in the interest of time, I know we've got some more great questions, uh, but we've run out of time here. We wanna stick to the time for those that need it. Um, but we will be continuing our discussion for those that are watching live. We have posted a Zoom link and I'll share it one more time before we switch over. Uh, so with that, thank you so much for your talk, Neil. And uh, we'll join you in just a few minutes on the Zoom discussion. And everyone, that Zoom discussion will allow folks to actually share their video and microphones so that we can actually have a discussion. And I'm going to save these questions before I close out the Zoom so that we can ask them in the next room. Thank you very much for attending and we will see you next week uh, for our next uh, live presentation. Thank you.